Did you have a nice day? Yes. What was your experience of the Lumbini Grove? How did it feel in there, in Lumbini? Very calm, still. Quiet, calm, peaceful, still. 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 And when you meditate, what did you feel? You mm. felt emptiness? <laughs> you felt what? Answer the look of Metta, of KVC. Maitri, love. Did anyone feel yeah. like... Kindness. Yeah, for me it's like just in the, in the act of sitting and becoming a little more kind of empty and spacious as a there's something else occurring it feels like something outside is nourishing for me that was my experience so it was a very nourishing energy did anyone else feel, feel that? stillness, peace and emptiness is uh, pretty nice mm. how did it feel when you bowed your head just inches from where the Bodhisattva was born words are difficult to describe isn't it it's really nice to do those three circumambulations and then take the time everybody bowing I feel um, very gratitude to the body. Mm-hmm. Gratitude to the body, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. How many? How did you feel? Uh, not loving kindness, loving sort of feeling. How many people today, after meditating, they felt gratitude to their mothers? Mm-hmm. Yeah, most people, mm-hmm. automatically. So I wanted to talk a little bit about, before I read, Aditana Bharami, this determination Bharami. Because when the Bodhisattva was born there, it was the culmination of an extremely long and arduous uh, process and a great unimaginable commitment. And so... In the process of building the Bharamis, it's described that the Bodhisattva made the vow under Dipankara Buddha at the time that he could have been an Arahant already. And then he built the perfections for four Asankaya and a hundred thousand eons. So if you understand that one eon is the time from which the universe, the Big Bang, and it expands, and then it contracts, and then it burns up in flames, and then it starts again, and apparently the whole reason it starts again is because of the karma of the beings that need to be reincarnated in the world. That's the force behind the Big Bang. So in this eon we've already had four Buddhas, and there's one to come, Maitreya. But if you understand that when they say four incalculable periods plus 100,000 eons, that 100,000 eons is the small bit. You understand that the four that those imponderable, which is called a a sankhaya, is just unimaginably long. So the hundred thousand is the extra bit at the end. It takes an extremely long time to fulfill the perfections. And one example is of a bird with a silk scarf flying over a one mile by one mile cube of rock. And it's like, however long it would take that bird to grind down that stone, dragging a silk scarf on a granite boulder. That's one eon. So a hundred thousand of those plus four more periods of time, which is much more. So it's important to understand this in in as much as like feeling the appropriate level of gratitude and respect for Buddha. And also for getting a sense for the power of darkness. It's like, it's not easy to penetrate the veil of ignorance. It's not easy to establish a Buddhist uh, dispensation in the world because uh, all beings, the power of ignorance, the majority of beings anyway, the power of ignorance is much more powerful than the power of virtue. So that gives darkness this enormous power. And then there are forces of darkness. So what the Bodhisattva has to do is accumulate just an enormous amount of virtue so that he can penetrate that darkness and illuminate it for a period of time. And he also needs to kind of rally forces. So the Maha, the great disciples, Sariputra, Mahamogalana, they built virtues for one incalculable period plus a hundred thousand eons. So the Bodhisattva was like thousands of eons into his process before those beings 
were inspired by him and started to train with him for that enormously long time so that he would have foremost disciples. And then the Arahants with the Abhinya, the psychic powers, the analytical knowledges, all of these beings built virtue with the Bodhisattva in hundreds and thousands of past lives so that when the Bodhisattva descended and was born in this place, there's just this huge investment and unimaginable commitment motivated by compassion so understanding that so many lives ago he could have been an arahant and entered the nibbana the deathless but he didn't I just get a sense for the incredible amount of suffering that he patiently endured because he wanted to do something about darkness understanding that beings have a potential which is superior than being under the sway of greed, hatred and delusion he wanted to help them realize it but we can't realize it without a Buddha we need that, it's like a huge umbrella or it's like a fortress that, uh, that he establishes a fortress with walls it's like when he explains keep the precepts when he explains you have to be generous when he explains karma and the need for practicing forgiveness and forbearance and tolerance that he is giving us the he's that establishing that container in, for us to practice within so that we can weaken and then destroy our own greed, hatred and delusion but greed, hatred and delusion are incredibly strong and without a Buddha and without his disciples teaching and teaching and teaching we would not work that out ourselves and it's really important to have that recognition because it's, it's humbling and that's not a guilt trip that's just to understand how awesome and uh, and many people mention the word love you can feel love in Lumbini so it's like that was in large part what was motivating the Bodhisattva to realize Dhamma and to teach people was that he cared he cared for all of us and was willing to struggle for so long to accumulate the necessary requisite merit there's two things the Bodhisattva has to cultivate in particular merit and then qualities so you need the qualities the compassion, the wisdom, all of those ten baramis we've been doing the chant and then you need that vast amount of merit it's like an example that's given is when the Buddha's under the Bodhi tree and he's actually enlightened already then the forces of Mara come and it's said that all of the devas disappeared it's so frightening when the forces of darkness rally that all of the devas fled and the only one there was left was the Buddha. And Mara was, was saying, you're not enlightened, you're not enlightened. And it's said that he called the earth goddess to come and to wring out her hair, all of the merit that he dedicated. You know that ceremony when we pour the water? And so she wrung out her hair and the, it was like an ocean of water came from her hair and washed away the hordes of Mara because that's how much merit. Because some people think that that's a metaphor. Maybe it is, but the merit is real. And it's like, if the Buddha didn't have that much merit to actually determine in that moment, the forces of darkness would obscure his realization, and they would obstruct his, uh, his teaching. But because he can do that, he has an ocean of merit. And we read the other day the verses where Mara came to tempt him. You know, Mara said when he was striving in a cave, you're close to death, this is useless, give up, go and make merit. And he made that very bold lion's roar. I am in, not in need of merit. You go and speak of merit to those who need it. Because he knew the merit was already accumulated. It was already there. There's a mountain of merit, an ocean of merit. So that takes a long time to cultivate. And then I think part of what we can feel here is when that Bodhisattva comes out of that womb, that merit is in the world. And it's said that a light feels the conditioned realm from the heavens to the hells and even beings in hell uh, see each other in the darkest parts of hell and they see oh that's how powerful the merit is when the bodhisattva uh, leaves that womb it feels the darkness of samsara it's amazing so we have very good fortune to be able to come in various specs where that happened but another thing just on that subject of determination Determination isn't just being determined to do, th- do something, it's also about the way we determine our merit and the way we determine the barami that we build, because that affects the outcome. There's that verse in the Dhammapada, mind is the forerunner, and it's from the Buddha himself, that verse. So, 
When the Buddha was building these Bharamis, he had one intention. As well as helping thousands and millions of beings along the way, he also had the intention to be the Buddha. That's the intention. If, you, if he didn't set that intention, the possibility to go off. The Bharami is energy, it's power. And so you end up with a lot of energy and a lot of power. You can end up as Mara. And there's that example of when Mahamogalana actually did. He was Mara in, a, in one life. You see, if you, if you have a lot of power and if you're into power, you can go astray. Because power is deluding. So when we make merit, we have to have a very clear goal. And we have to dedicate merit specifically to realizing that goal. So when you come on pilgrimage, and I keep mentioning, suggesting, that after the meditation, after the, the readings, after the offerings, that we set our aspiration at these places. Because particularly in these places, I think it leaves an even deeper imprint. When we're making karma, it depends on the purity of our intention. It also depends on the purity of the object. So when we're here, the objects are very pure. We have the four holy sites that the Buddha himself said uh, were, would be very useful for beings to make a pilgrimage to and make offerings to. So we have those pure objects and we can set that aspiration and it's very powerful. So determining. One is being determined whenever you make a vow or a commitment. You have to fulfill it. That, that building determination bar me. But when you make merit, the way you make an aspirational prayer or a vow is another way of determining the merit or determining the outcome due to this merit may I attain the deathless due to this merit may I realize the sorrowless, the unconditioned this is very important the Buddha obviously did maintain his focus he did maintain his determination and he did determine all of his merit to this particular goal so that under the Bodhi tree, when he did realize ultimate truth, he was able to call that merit to wash away the darkness. And there's this other beautiful metaphor where it said the weapons of Mara, when they came close to the Buddha's body, turned into flowers. So the weapons were real. And the ill will, the anger, the com competition, the domineering, the forces of Mara that don't want the Buddha to succeed, very powerful. And their very real weapons, according to conventional reality, were transformed into flowers by that goodness. It's very beautiful. And it's, it's symbolic of something else as well. It's symbolic of a fact which is very important for us all to meditate upon and to feel confidence in, particularly in times when we're suffering a lot, is that the power of goodness is superior to the power of darkness and suffering. I think that's a really important thing to know and to believe and to hold on to, especially when going gets tough, when there's a temptation to get mean or nasty or retaliate or get, become cynical or bitter, which we all can. And it's just like, really have faith and confidence that the power of goodness is superior, that uh, the barami leads to the deathless, and the kilesas get left behind if we keep practicing. give a little bit of a reading. Some of what I'm going to read is commentarial, so I think the chanting, the chanta, it's very beautiful, but it was written afterwards. doesn't mean it's not real, but uh, a lot of it is what Lord Buddha told Ananda himself and was recorded in the First Council. So Ananda is saying, Ananda was talking to some monks and he was, he was Ananda loved the Buddha very much. And he was saying how wonderful the Buddha was, and the Buddha walked past, I think it was in Jetavana, where we're going tomorrow. And he was uh, asked him, what were you talking about? And he was talking about the wonderful qualities of the Buddha, and so he asked him, okay, so what were you saying? And he said, I heard and learned this, Lord, from the Blessed One's own lips. Mindful and fully aware, the Bodhisattva remained in the heaven of the contented, that's to see to heaven. For the whole of that lifespan, the Bodhisattva remained in the heaven of the contented. Mindful and fully aware, the Bodhisattva passed away from the heaven of the contented and descended into his mother's womb. How many people can remember descending into their mother's room? Can anybody remember that? Okay, the reason I ask that is just to point out the fact that the Bodhisattva is special. I can't say, but I was mindful and fully aware. What's your earliest memory? 
Mine's from about three. 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 Right. When the Bodhisattva had passed away from the heaven and contented and entered his mother's womb, a great measureless light surpassing the splendor of the gods appeared in the world with its deities, its maras, and its Brahma divinities. In this generation with its monks and Brahmins, with its princes and men, and even in those abysmal world into spaces of vacancy, gloom, and utter darkness, where the moon and sun, powerful and mighty as they are, cannot make their light prevail. There, too, a great measureless light surpassing the splendor of the gods appeared, and the creatures born there perceived each other by that light. So it seems that other creatures have appeared here, and this ten thousand-fold world system shook and quaked and trembled, and there, too, a great measureless light surpassing the splendor of the gods appeared. When the Bodhisattva had descended into his mother's womb, four deities came to guard him from the four quarters, so that no human or non-human being, or anyone at all, should harm his or her mother. When the Bodhisattva had descended into his mother's womb, she became intrinsically pure, refraining by necessity from killing living beings, from taking what is not given, from unchastity, from false speech, and from indulgence in wine, liquor, and fermented brews. When the Bodhisattva had descended into his mother's womb, no thought of man associated with the five strands of sensual desires came to her at all, and she was inaccessible to any man with lustful mind. Why would that be, do you think? Why would the mother of the Bodhisattva <coughs> not have any sensual thoughts while the Bodhisattva was in her womb? Any ideas? Yeah, you can imagine how many thousands of lifetimes the Buddha has successfully been suppressing the hindrances from his mind and that purity is coming in and how many thousands of lifetimes he's already been a Brahma Deva and remembering that the Buddha as a child entered jhana under a rose apple tree without having had any teachings so it's very special when the Bodhisattva had descended into his mother's womb she at the same time possessed the five strands of sensual desires, and being endowed and furnished with them, she was gratified in them. So that just means pleasant taste, pleasant sounds, pleasant sights. And, uh, why would that be? Pleasant feeling is a result of merit, just as unpleasant feeling is a result of demerit or bad karma. So you imagine you've got this being inside with this ocean of merit. And even other people who might have had lustful feelings about her couldn't come near her. You've got the four divine kings from the, from the closest heaven realm guarding him already. Pretty amazing. When the Bodhisattva had descended into his mother's womb, no kind of affliction rose in her. She was blissful in the absence of all bodily fatigue. As though a blue, yellow, red, white or brown thread was strung through a fine gem of purest water, eight-faceted and well-cut, so that a man with, with sound eyes, taking it in his hand, might review it thus. This fine gem of purest water, eight-faceted and well-cut, and through it is strung a blue, yellow, red, white or brown thread. So too the Bodhisattva's mother saw him within her womb with all his limbs, lacking no faculty. Seven days after the Bodhisattva was born, his mother died and was reborn in the heaven of the contented. This is something that people sometimes wonder about. Why? Ajahn Oh said that uh, she thinks it's because no other being can use that womb after a, a Bodhisattva. It's important to understand that the mother of the Bodhisattva must have had a very particular vow, which she cultivated for a long time. So her intention in being born that lifetime is to give birth to the Bodhisattva, who will become a Buddha. So once her task is done, she's done her job. It's important to understand that she would have been working on that vow for thousands of lives. So, basically she gets to go to heaven really quickly. It's not a painful death. She's instantly reborn in heaven of the contented. Interestingly enough, as a man. I like to mention this because this whole thing of gender, we love to fix it, don't we? The Buddha's mother, we still want her to be the Buddha's mother, but now it's a guy. <laughs> now, he, she is going to be reborn as a woman and give birth to Maitreya. Probably become an Arahant in that life. 
But I was also wondering about that vow, or how you build the requisite virtue to be the mother of Bodhisattva. And it must be a very long process. I think in the beginning you give birth to someone who's going to be a Sotapanna, and then you give birth, they feel like they <coughs> someone who is a Sotapanna, and then you give birth to incarnate Rinpoche, Lama, and then you give birth to great disciples. I mean, it really must be something like that. What would make you the one? In terms of having the highest honor in samsara, or one of the highest honors in samsara, you would have to work up from smaller honors to bigger honors <laughs> to high honors to the highest honor. So this, what's her, her his name now? Maya Tepabut. Maya Tepabut. Yeah, Maya Deva. Maya Tepabut. In that time it was Maha Maya. So uh, it'd be great to have a chat with him and ask him <laughs> how many lives he's been incarnating as a woman and giving birth to special beings. Must be thousands. Could you imagine giving birth, carrying in your womb Maitreya Bodhisattva? Maitreya built Varami for 16 Asankayas, four times as long as our Buddha. Amazing. So, so Buddhas who, whose foremost quality is wisdom are born at a degenerating part of the yoga. Buddhas who cultivate the Bodhisattva path with effort, which takes four times as long, are born at just after the peak of the yoga. So imagine the amount of merit uh, that Maitreya has. Amazing. Anyway, you don't need to think that it's not fair that the mum died or it's a shame that she died. <laughs> I'm sure she had a very peaceful death, and I'm sure that she, he, is very happy now, and uh, we can rejoice. Other women give birth after carrying the child in the womb for nine or ten months, but not so the Bodhisattva's mother. She gave birth to him after carrying him in her womb for exactly ten months. Other give, women give birth seated or lying down, but not so the Bodhisattva's mother. She gave, gave birth to him standing up. When the Bodhisattva came forth from his mother's womb, first deities received him, then human beings. When the Bodhisattva came forth from his mother's womb, he did not touch the earth. Four deities receive him and set him before his mother, saying, Rejoice, O Queen, a son of great power has been born to you. When the Bodhisattva came forth from his mother's womb, just as if a gem were placed on Banara's cloth, the gem would not smear the cloth, or the cloth the gem, why not? Because both are pure. So too the Bodhisattva came forth from his mother's womb unsullied, unsmeared by water or humors or blood or any sort of impurity clean and unsullied. When the Bodhisattva came forth from his mother's womb, two jets of water appeared to, to pour from the sky, one cool and one warm, for bathing the Bodhisattva and his mother. As soon as the Bodhisattva was born, he stood firmly with his feet on the ground. Then he took seven steps to the north, and with a white sunshade held over him, he surveyed each quarter. He uttered the words of the leader of the herd, I am the highest in the world. I am the best in the world. I am the foremost in the world. This is the last birth. Now there is no more renewal of being in future lives. I knew one lady who had a Chinese restaurant in Sydney. And she decided that she didn't like the Buddha because he was arrogant. <laughs> <laughs> because he said, I'm the highest in the world, I'm the best in the world, I'm the foremost in the world. So that was a grave misunderstanding. When the Buddha says that, I said this earlier today, it's not conceit, it's not arrogance. It's coming from clear knowing. When he <coughs> surveyed the world, he could see that he had the most virtue. It's true. It's not a lie, it's not an exaggeration, it's not based in arrogance. It's based in the fact that he has a very, very special goal, which he's about to realize, and he's foremost in the world. So we were looking at that statue offered by the Thais, the one hand raised, foremost in the world, the one hand lowered, last birth. When the Bodhisattva came forth from his mother's womb, a great measureless light surpassing the splendor of the gods appeared in the world with its deities, its maras and its brahma divinities, in this generation with its monks and brahmins, with its princes and men. And even in those abysmal world interspaces of vacancy, gloom, and utter darkness, where the moon and sun, powerful and mighty as they are, cannot make their light prevail. There too a great measureless light surpassing the splendor of the gods appeared, and the creatures born there perceived each other by that light. So it seems that other creatures have appeared here. 
and this ten thousand fold world system shook and quaked and trembled and thereto a great measureless light surpassing the splendor of the gods appeared all these things I heard and learned from the blessed one's own lips and I remember them as a wonderful and marvelous quality of the blessed one I love this statement by the Buddha that being so Ananda remember also this as a wonderful and marvelous quality of a perfect one a perfect one's feelings of pleasure, pain or equanimity are known to him as they arise, known to him as they are present, and known to him as they subside. His perceptions are known to him as they rise, known to him as they are present, and known to him as they subside. His thoughts are known to him as they arise, known to him as they are present, and known to him as they subside. And that I also remember Lord as a wonderful and marvelous quality of the Blessed One. So the Buddha is speaking to Ananda as an Arhant, who has Mahasati, perfect mindfulness of the four foundations of mindfulness all the time that's what makes him that's really what makes him special is his mind is established in the deathless and he's not confused about the five khandhas he sees a body as a body thoughts as thoughts feelings as feelings all the time without perceiving it as a self and it's important to remember that isn't it because otherwise it can become legend and we can get lost I mean it's, it's so beautiful one could easily get lost in it as a story and then you have loving devotion and gratitude for the Buddha, which is good. But Satha, the first of the five spiritual powers, but then you have your Sati, your Samadhi and your Panya, as well as energy. So we take our faith, give rise to energy, and then we apply it in the practice of cultivating the Eightfold Path. That's really important. And this is what the Buddha is pointing to here. Remember that the Buddha is the truly mindful one, unconfused about thoughts, feelings, and the body and their nature, seeing them arising, seeing them ceasing, knowing them as they are. And that also I remember as a wonderful and marvelous quality of the Blessed One. That is what the Venerable Ananda said, the Master approved, the bhikkhus were satisfied, and they delighted in the Venerable Ananda's words. There's this story now of when the king asked the sage, Asita, like a, he's like a rishi, to come and look at the physical signs of the baby to see about his future. The sage Asita in his daytime meditation saw that the gods, those of the company of thirty, were happy and gay or brightly clad waving flags, and while their ruler, Saka or Indra, they were wildly cheering. Now when he saw the gods so happy and elated, respectfully, he greeted them and asked them this, Why is the company of gods so joyful? Why have they brought out flags to brandish thus? There was no celebration such as this, even after the battle with the demons, wherein the gods won and the demons lost. I'm not sure about the word gods, we could use the word devas anyway. This is the Dawa Timsa, Heaven of the 33. What marvel have they heard that so delights them? See how they sing and shout and strum guitars, <coughs> clapping their hands and dancing all about. O you that dwell on Meru's airy peaks, I beg you, leave me not in doubt, good sirs. So the ministers have seen something and they tell Indra, At a Sakyan city in the land of Lumbini, a being to be enlightened, a priceless jewel, is born in the world of men for welfare and weal. Because of that we are extravagantly gay. The unique being, the personality sublime, the lord of all men and foremost amongst mankind, will turn the wheel in the grove of the ancient seers, with the roar of the lion, the monarch of all beasts. On hearing this, the sage in haste went to Sudorana's abode, where he sat down. Where is the boy? He asked the Sakyans, show him to me. Okay, so the king didn't ask him to come. The sage has seen it in his own meditation. So this would be someone through the power of whose meditation has the purified divine eye, the capacity to see subtle body beings and other realms. It's called abhinya. That's one of the one of the skills that comes from very powerful samadhi. So he's seen that. Oh, the devas are rejoicing, brandishing flags, playing guitars, singing songs. He hasn't seen them so happy. What happened? The bodhisattva was born. He's going to be a Buddha. So. Some people think that this is, uh, you know, it's commentary, it might not be real, but it makes perfect sense to me that you've been building merit for so long, and this flash of light has already occurred entering the womb, and there's another flash of light has occurred at birth. The Dawa Timsa heaven is, uh, is just two up. There's many heavens. So I should think that they would see that, that supernatural flash of light and be very interested. 
And I would also think of the case that many of these devas have also built barmi with the bodhisattva. The virtuous tend to know the virtuous. <coughs> the good take after the good. And the result of virtue and the result of merit is heavenly rebirth, among other things. That's one of the results. So uh, I don't think, I don't doubt it myself. I suspect that the devas were rejoicing at the birth of the bodhisattva. Now when the Sakyan showed the child to a Sita, his color was as pure as beams of brilliant gold wrought in a crucible, shining and clear. The joy of rapture flooded a Sita's heart on seeing the boy bright as a flame and pure as the Lord of the Stars riding in the sky. Dazzling as the cloudless autumn sun, while gods in the heavenly vault held over him a many-ribbed sunshade with a thousand circles, brandishing gold-sticked chauris, though none saw the holders of the sunshade and the chauris. Okay, so the sage Asita could see all of this. He could see what celestial beings were doing, celebrating and, and making merit by serving and protecting the Bodhisattva. The sage with matted hair called Kanhasiri, seeing the boy like a gold jewel upon brocade with the white sunshade held above his head, received him full of joy and happiness. As soon as he received the Sakyan's lord, the adept in construing marks and signs exclaimed with ready confidence of heart, Among the biped race he is unique. Then he remembered, seeing his own lot, in very sadness tears came to his eyes. The Sakyan saw him weeping and they asked, Will some misfortune then befall our prince? But to the anxious Sakyans he replied, As I foresee, no harm will touch the boy, nor is there any danger that awaits him. Be sure he is not of the second rank, for he will reach the summit of true knowledge, a seer of the peerless purity. Through pity for the many, he will set the Dharma wheel turning and spread his life of holiness. But little of my lifespan now remains, and I shall die meanwhile. I shall not hear the matchless hero teaching the good Dharma. That saddens me. That loss distresses me. Probably a rishi or a sage with such good meditation is bound for the Brahma realms. Some of those Brahma realms the devas are absorbed in samadhi the whole lifetime, not capable of listening to dharma or reflecting on noble truths. So, reviewing the bodhisattva's destiny to be the Buddha, the sage is also aware of his next life, and he realizes that he's going to miss, he's going to miss the Buddha, and he's very sad. He that lived the holy life left the inner palace chamber after he had filled the sakyans with an all-abounding joy. To his sister's son he went, moved by feelings of compassion, telling him the peerless hero's future finding of the Dhamma. When news shall reach you that he is enlightened and living out the Dhamma he has found, go to him and ask about his teaching and live with the Blessed One that holy life. So Nalika, who had laid up a store of merit, forewarned by one who wished him well, who had foreseen the being to come, attained to utter purity, waited with guarded senses, expecting the victor. On hearing that the noble victor had rolled the wheel, he went to him, he saw the lord of all the seers, and trusted in him when he saw. Fulfilling Asita's behest, he questioned then the perfect sage about the silentness supreme. So the Bodhisattva was born, destined to be born at that time. When he asked, when he made his offering to Dipankara Buddha, and asked, for the confirmation of becoming a Buddha, only Buddhas can see the exact outcome of the various types of merit that beings make. So Dipankara Buddha was able to see in so many eons, in so many ages of expansion and contraction later, that Bodhisattva. What was his name in that life? Sumedha. Sumedha, yes. So, uh, he could see that he would become Shakyamuni Buddha with the name Gautama and the surname Shakya. So it was destined from that point when you when the Bodhisattva had accumulated that much merit and then made a very powerful gesture. He allowed the Buddha to walk on him, meaning he lay down in a puddle of mud. And so he saw the Buddha, he was so moved, he saw this puddle of mud, he lay down and, and the Buddha asked the Buddha, I think the Buddha didn't want to walk at first, but he asked him to please as a way of making great merit and so then he got his prediction that you will be the Shakyamuni Gautama Buddha of the Shakyans born in Lumbini so many thousands of eons later so 
that's another reason why it makes sense to me that the devas would be aware of it. Once something is, you know, in a way fated through the power of determination and merit, then I think devas could be aware of it. There's this whole cast of, of beings that are ready to play their role as well. When the Bodhisattva descended from heaven, he didn't descend alone. Cousins, princes, princesses, the horse that, that he rode out of the palace on, when the, he was in the chariot, but the horse. I think even the spirit that lives in the Bodhi tree. There's a David that lives in the Bodhi tree that comes and, and is in the Bodhi tree. This whole, you could imagine, if you were in one of the lower heavens, there's this whole rain of radiant beings falling down to the human realm, ready to play their role that they've already made vows. You've got the first person who realized Dhamma, he made his vow. You've got the foremost in wisdom, the foremost in psychic powers, the expounder of short verses, the, the one who can explain the long verses, the foremost in austerities, all of the, the monks and the nuns, and also the lay disciples. You've got Visaka, you've got Anatta Pindika, you've got King Bimbisara, all of these great beings with a vast store of merit who have their role to play. So that in India at that time, it's hard to know how many that uh, I would say hundreds of thousands of enlightened beings, fully enlightened beings in this part of India. Must have been amazing. Every other forest monastery must have been full of sages. Must have been awesome. And that those kingdoms, Magadha and Kosala, the kings were so sympathetic to uh, spiritual practice and such uh, generous supporters, benefactors of the order. Amazing. The fact that we're here, I would say probably we spent some time in India when Buddhism was uh, was powerful and strong. We probably built Barami here and then we were reborn in places where we meet the Dhamma again and continue to practice and keep building our Barami. So for many of us, probably coming back to places we've been, they're probably not what they were. <laughs> not like they used to be. <laughs> but when you get when you get to those holy sites though, really feel I remember the first time I was meditating under the Bodhi tree 11 years ago a, a feeling of I have been here but it was different, very different I <laughs> remember kind of this confused sense of I've been here but it, it wasn't like this and there's probably a lot of forest around, it was very quiet there's 90 million people in Bihar and 200 million people in Uttar Pradesh now not many trees left <laughs> lots of trucks but Lumbini, because Nepal has much less population, I think it's much easier to get land. So with the help of the United Nations, there's a huge amount of land around the holy site. How many people enjoyed that walking this morning into the grove in the mist with the sunrise? It's so nice to be able to take the time to practice mindfulness and, and really be there and really arrive as we approach the holy site. And, uh, until very recently right up to the gate of the Mahabodhi temple you just had people harassing you <laughs> for selling flowers and and uh, CDs and malas and bodhi leaves and all those guys that are now in the ring road they used to be all the way to the gate samsara kind of swarming around the holy side did anyone have any experiences today or any questions about Bambini or a big rich day you went and looked at all these temples in the afternoon mm -hmm. it's nice to see these uh, when you think about how many buildings are for banking and for insurance and for stock exchange and for these things it's nice to see beautiful temples to to the Buddha on one level you can say the first generations of monks were forest, forest dwellers and nuns living under trees and uh, and it's true but then also in the Buddha's life he did build, he had he accepted the Velavana, which was very beautiful, and he accepted the monastery that Wisaka built, which is even more beautiful. But um, it's a way of expressing <coughs> gratitude and respect, isn't it? When you when the greatest artists of a nation with the royal patronage these institutions are developed and it's a double edged sword. The institutions can support a great deal of practice. They can also become corrupt. But uh, certainly for, my, for myself, as Buddhist art often captures qualities in a way that words don't. So when the artists... And I 
personally suspect in a couple of days we're going to go to the Sarnath Museum and I suspect that the artists were actually having visions of the Buddha and uh, the disciples because some of these statues that you see, the real masterpieces, they capture compassion, wisdom, <coughs> purity and metta in rock. Mm. It's not an easy thing to do. And it's like, I suspect that they were seeing it. And I could be wrong. So tomorrow, I think it's really important we've come all this way. I know we have a long bus ride, and it's tempting to think, have a little sleep in, but we put a lot of effort into coming here. It's a very special place. And I do believe that if you can bring your mind to some kind of tranquility in the holy site, the blessings will be far greater. It's in making your mind a receptive vessel to receive the blessings. So we need to have the lunch a little earlier because, and we need to pack before the lunch, so because of that I'd like us to go a little earlier. But the next day in Sabati, just to let you see a little bit of the next few days, you can have a little sleep in. So tomorrow, I suggest a four, five, six. Oh, four. Four. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Let's make it five.